Greetings everyone, I'm the delicious and mythical Griffin Muffin. Welcome to my first review! Today we're talking about Pillars of Eternity, which is a game about souls, gods, and piety. So let's get stuck in, shall we? So, what is Pillars of Eternity? It is an RPG, or CRPG, with an isometric viewpoint providing an emphasis on tactical gameplay and combat, as well as player-dependent decision-driven storytelling, or what is more commonly known as PDDS. I lied, no one says that. Anyway, other games in this genre include Baldur's Gate, Icewind Dale, Planescape Torment, and some even consider Fallout 2 to be grouped in this slot. I myself have played the Baldur's Gate and Icewind Dale series of games, and I consider these to be some of my favourite childhood games. If you look up a couple of these games, you'll see a common denominator, Black Isle Studios. Black Isle Studios closed its doors in 2003, but before it did, some ex-employees formed Obsidian Entertainment. The developer entered some financial trouble after Fallout New Vegas, so Josh Sawyer, a designer at Obsidian, decided that the next game would be crowdfunded. It was dubbed Project Eternity later becoming the game that we're talking about right now, Pillars of Eternity. In the first 24 hours, it had $1.1 million in donations and stands in the top five of the most successful video game Kickstarters as of making this video. Did it live up to the hype though? I mean, uh, there have been some uh, Kickstarter flops. Get out of here, money number nine. But needless to say, it did great. It revisits an old genre of games that died out and they successfully revived it. It didn't do anything particularly different it just made an excellent continuation of the genre. If you wanted to try out a CRPG or see a new variant of an RPG, I highly recommend this one. Now I'm gonna tell you why. Gameplay and mechanics. The games before Pillars of Eternity or PoE or Poe or however you wanna say it, such as Baldur's Gate and Icewind Dale, relied heavily on the former Dungeons and Dragons rule sets from the tabletop games to be implemented into a video game. I think this is why some people call these games CRPGs, as a tabletop rule set is being transferred over to a computer game. In most of these CRPGs, you control a group of six characters. In Poe, you create one character and recruit five out of eight companions in the world of Aeora, similar to Baldur's Gate. Character creation in an RPG can be very stressful. Well, with at least I think it's stressful. Which one is the right one? I have to do that first and that's not right. However, Poe does a great job at providing tooltips for certain keywords during character creation and exploiting each aspect of your character. Poe doesn't rely on a formally established set of rules from a popular tabletop game, but instead has invented its own tabletop-like system. What I mean by tabletop-like system is having synonymous mechanics like armor class instead being swapped out for deflection, a separate endurance and health meter instead of just one meter of hit points. It was refreshing to see a new take on this aspect of CRPGs. I personally think that copying a tabletop rule set is a double-edged sword, so inventing a new one was the right choice, and that would have been quite the challenge for Obsidian to do on top of making a video game. So, uh, kudos to Obsidian. The combat is not the fast-paced, button-mashing style of most AAA RPGs today, but instead relies on pseudo-turn-based combat with careful tactical planning. This, no doubt, is due to the origins of these games in Dungeons & Dragons transplanted rule sets, which work better in a turn-based style of combat. However, in PoE, it is anything but dull. With the pause mechanic, you can plan the actions of your party members to be almost contiguous to one another, to form the perfect plan that will eliminate your enemies. You can modify the speed of combat, program when the game will pause for you to reassess your tactics. <clears throat> for me it was when uh, <clears throat> someone died. I cannot imagine playing this game without a pause button, especially for later fights near the end. I would have died so much more. Speaking of dying a lot, you really have to pay attention while in a battle to a variety of factors in PoE, such as actions and weaknesses of your enemies, your party's positioning, their combat roles and healthiness, as well as keeping track of spells and abilities that have been used. Stats of enemies are displayed and can show useful information about whatever you are fighting which will influence your plan of attack. Getting grips on what each of your party members does in a fight is critical. So you usually have the holy trinity of parties, which is drugs, loud music, and wait. Oh, sorry, I meant to type RPG parties. Give me a second. And there we go. Which in that case is a tank, healer, and damage dealer. My character fit the damage dealer bill perfectly. You see, there are 11 classes in PoE. Barbarian, Chanter, Cypher, Druid, Fighter, Monk, Paladin, Priest, Ranger, Rogue, Wizard. I rolled a rogue and even gave him a cute little backstory where he was once a raider in the Deadfire Archipelago and has decided to adventure inland. So basically he was a pirate. And I can imagine it went down something like this. Do what you want cause a pirate is free. You are a pirate. You are a pirate. Being a pirate is a wretched Do what you want cause a pirate is free. You are a pirate. Hey what? 
but as you go along, you can fine tune your companion's roles in your party to whatever suits you best. Me personally, I had a defense heavy tank, damage dealing paladin, a healer with massive buffs, a wizard for explosions, and my hybrid druid. He literally can be a fighter, a healer, or a spellcaster, and I just loved his backstory in the game. Then there was me, the dashing rogue elf, with looks that could kill. And uh, yeah, I, I guess the crossbow helps too. Sound and music. The music in this game was great. I can't think of much to compliment it with other than to say it was very fitting for Poe, PoE, whatever. Apparently the music composer for this game, Justin Bell, was inspired by this game's predecessors, such as Baldur's Gate, and it certainly shows. The music gives hints in a lot of maps of wonder, yet forlornness. In my opinion, this matched the aesthetic this game was going for. The battle music that plays each time didn't get annoying, which would be critical, as you enter fights a fair bit. However, I did find that it lacked in variation from the two or three battle tracks that are in the game, which was a tad disappointing. I remember in Baldur's Gate and Icewind Dale, special music tracks would play for different bosses throughout the game, which really produced an intense atmosphere and gave each of those final enemies to beat a sense of identity almost. The sound design was top notch, and it's the little things you notice that really bring it all together. The sound of your party's footprints differing from forest to city, how they sound different moving in different armor they've equipped, the casting of spells feels awesome, and combat doesn't sound tinny or stock-like. This might not seem to be sound and music based to mention, but the choice of language influences of Cornish and Gaelic was awesome. It really made it set itself apart from other medieval fantasy RPG worlds, and gave it the sense of timelessness that I personally think resonates with the Gaelic language. Fun fact, the phrases that spellcasters chant upon casting in PoE are actually in-game languages of Old Adiran and in Gwythin, much like how the previous games the spell incantations were poorly spoken Latin phrases. And I think attention to details like this is what makes a world like Aeora come to life. Art Design and Graphics a common design choice for the CRPG genre is to have a series of bordered, backdrop-like maps that are fully detailed, that look stunning, and provide a great atmosphere for you to traverse through. In this game, unlike its predecessors, the maps have moving features like water and fire. Yes, the previous games would have still rivers and such, which would sometimes break the suspension of disbelief. I think this design choice allows the developers to commit more time into making each map unique seeing as they don't have to spend so much time rendering multiple 3D assets and such, and give you a great scenery or dungeon to explore. The art design of Pillars of Eternity seen in these maps is great, and although I'm reminded of the other Infinity Engine games before it, it's not a carbon copy of it. I can really get a feeling of the hard work it took to make, say, a tavern look different from the house next to it, and the Ingwithin ruins you explore throughout the game have an amazing aesthetic, that seem to have Celtic Gaelic influences. I even noticed on how a lot of the Ingwithin ruins, they have an emphasis on circular rooms and objects, and even structures, which could relate to the power the Ingwithins had over the wheel, the soul recycler in Aora. The character models in PoE are sufficient. Well, they're certainly better than the ones in Icewind Dale and Baldur's Gate, that is. Why, hello there. I am Krondor, the faceless man. But I personally didn't like how sharp they look sometimes and really stick out against the backdrops especially those with metal armor on for some reason. This isn't a huge problem, as you're usually viewing them from up high and on an angle, but it still got to me at some points. The spell effects in this game were awesome. It was clear what spell was going off and where. It was awesome to see a certain spell just fly forth and... Watch the colors stream out and... Whoa, look at all the colors. Whoa, Jesus. Oh man. It was not a good idea to take shrooms before I did this review. Narrative and storytelling. This part is where Pillars of Eternity really shines. Storytelling is done through windowed text dialogue and player decision-based plot development. Your character starts off as a humble adventurer, or whatever, and gets involved in something much bigger than him or herself, and is thrown into a life that is actually quite unfortunate. You become a watcher, a fabled seer of the spirit world who can manipulate and see souls. This may sound awesome, but as you play along, you start to become aware that, well, it kind of sucks. Such as how watchers are haunted by the voices of their past lives and of the souls within the wheel. Personally, I don't know which could be worse, being a watcher or being the father of an eight-month-old infant. Oh my god, I haven't slept properly for eight months! And yes, this game actually proposes reincarnation as a main part of the cosmological architecture of Aora, a cycle of repurposing souls from the deceased and entering them into newborn children. As you play the game, you start to become more aware of one of your past lives, which coincidentally 
is shared with the main bad of this game, Theos X Arcanon, which should enter a place in the top 5 of the most badass villain names of all time. As you pursue Theos, you are slowly introduced to the provinces within the Deerwood, which range from the coastal city of Defiance Bay through to the Twin Elms. The people in this game show fierce piety toward their pantheon of gods. The piety these people have in their gods is believable, something I don't think a lot of RPGs have done so brilliantly. Piety and faith are powerful motivators for a person, in our world or Aora. This game explores faith as a driving force. You can see this even in your companions, and even through Theos, the main antagonist. Faith achieves great things for some people in the Deerwood. It inspires them and makes them want to be better people, while, on the other hand, horrible atrocities have been committed in the name of a certain god. And the shared similarities with what Pillars of Eternity discusses in a narrative form and our own human history is inescapable. I can't say much more to avoid spoilers, but Pillars of Eternity is a great continuation of this genre of games and improves on the aspects of such a game. It is one of the few games in existence that actually allows moments of self-examination of your actions upon the world through your companions that accompany. This really makes Aora, which at face value, can appear to be your run-of-the-mill medieval fantasy RPG world to be actually well-constructed and feel more alive. Like the other games before it, Poe creates interesting and diverse companions which further drive this feeling of a vivid world. I would really put this on your must-play list to get a glimpse on how medieval fantasy RPGs can be done. From here, I want to talk spoilers to you guys and gals, so if you want to avoid Spoiler Town, please follow the time code below and watch from there. Here we go. So, I wanted to mention actually a couple things that annoyed me about Pillars of Eternity. But to do that, I need to mention the ending as well as the major boss of the game. First off, the stronghold you end up controlling has an evil lurking beneath it, an Adra Dragon that is a thousand years old. A bit more serious than termites. You grind through 15 levels of a mega dungeon only to have a boss that is nearly impossible to kill. I mean, after 30 attempts, I got him down to badly injured. And then this happened. Need something? <laughs> oh, that's it. This fight was not fun. It really disappointed me that after a month of delving into this dungeon underneath the stronghold, that I was greeted with a boss that was nearly immune to everything. And it, it, if it didn't have an immunity, it had a ridiculous resistance to it. That doesn't make it challenging. It just makes it frustrating. I mean, when I first went to confront Theos at the end of the game, I came to learn that it was recommended that I be max level before I confront him. This really disappointed me, and it killed the flow of the game for me, as I had to reload to an old save and grind more bounties for two weeks before I could actually enter the final act, knowing I had a chance. Maybe it was wrong of me to assume this, but I imagine having the final encounter scale to your party's average level, this, this would have been the better thing to do. This game is focused on a grand, epic story. And for it to be hindered by essentially wandering into a zone that's too high level for you, it really ruined the experience for me. However, that's all I really didn't like about this game. I now want to talk about what this game is really about. Well, at least to me. And I want to know if you agree, if you've played it, that is. This game isn't about you. This isn't your typical power fantasy indulgence. This game doesn't entirely empower you, instead it burdens you. For most of your companions, your powers as a watcher influence their growth and character development. And you can say that you grow, as you've helped a companion through their existential crisis, but there is no definite indication of your own growth, and I think that's deliberate. In my opinion, this game pulls back the curtain behind a lot of medieval fantasy RPG games, and gives us a different gaming experience of ambiguity and humility. You are nothing compared to the might of the gods, and the people of Aora are wrapped around their fingers. It's all the more astonishing when you find out that the gods are not even real. They were created by the Anguithans after they found out that there was no all-powerful builders of the universe or some divine creator. Each of the party members react to this in their own way. This development in the story really blew me away, and it was so refreshing for a medieval fantasy game to just dissolve this trope of a pantheon of all-powerful gods. Even when you defeat Theos and decide to do whatever you want to do with the thousands of souls he's trapped, you're more than likely going to piss off somebody, no matter what you choose. I chose to restore those souls to the wheel. I did this because I didn't want to be a supplicant to a group of fake gods, so I disobeyed them, and they punished the Deerwood for it. Needless to say, I felt a bit bad and a bit immature, and 
Yeah, I wholly regretted my choice. I did like how the game ended for me personally. Even though in my playthrough, the Deerwood seems worse off now. Sorry. If you want to get yourself a copy, you can find it on Steam and GOG.com. Now, I'm just gonna let you know, it took me nearly 86 hours to complete this game. So if you're wanting to dive into this rabbit hole, maybe book some time off work or play during a study break. So then, without further ado, I give this game an overall rating of four and a half muffins out of five. This game is a great continuation of the CRPG genre. It improved the game in so many ways. The story told was refreshing and stirring, and the world, and along with the people in it, really made it feel alive. However, some of the disappointments in certain encounters and my personal dislike of the character models and lack of variation in some music tracks kicked this game from getting a full buffet of five muffins. However, these dislikes are overshadowed by my intense praise to the storytelling. All throughout the game, I was placed in a position of ambiguity. I haven't really had an experience like this since Witcher 3, and that's my litmus test of RPG games, basically. And considering how I was more worried about how my actions in the game were going to change the world or my companions, this further emphasizes how this game is not about you. It's about everyone else. The responsibility of thousands of souls weighs on your shoulders in this game. You alone, but you survived. And meanwhile, you helped those closest to you as well. Hey everyone, after my 100 subscribers video, I saw that there was a bit of demand for the return of the Witcher chapter recaps I used to do. If you do not know what I am talking about, I encourage you to check out my chapter recaps of the Witcher books by Andrzej Szybkowski. Anyway, for those who are familiar with my Witcher chapter recap videos, I've decided to start a Patreon. With your donations, we'll be able to make the chapter recap videos come out more regularly. Now, no, I just want to stress, this is not to say that if no one signs up, there will be no more recap videos. The donations provided will allow me to pay off the artist faster and therefore make the video come out sooner. I intend to use the donations to fund the recap videos, but also they will simultaneously help the channel to grow, which would lead to videos coming out more frequently and each video being of better quality. If you feel like helping out the channel or are keen to see more of these recaps sooner, follow the link in the description below for more details. But if you don't feel comfortable or don't want to donate, seriously, it's all good. I'm still going to make videos of all sorts and I don't want to make you feel obligated to support me. But if you want to help me in other ways other than Patreon, seriously, just share this video with your mates. Twitter, Facebook, oh speaking of which, I now have a Facebook page. I put up memes, recent videos, discuss topics. All that sort of stuff, so head on over there when you can. Like, comment, subscribe. Do all that lovely stuff down below. And I'll see you later.